today, uh, so I'm going to give you some data, um, but really I'm going to sort of talk a lot about um, how I see, you know, into 100 years, how phage research, um, uh, where, it, where it will go, and in particular how synergies between synthetic biology and evolutionary biology will really sort of uh, drive some, some innovation. Okay, so I um, normally synthetic uh, evolutionary biology and synthetic biology are housed in very different departments on campuses. Um, this is the UCSD map where you can see uh, that uh, all of us evolutionary biologists represented by the butterfly uh, are, uh, are separated from where most of the synthetic biologists are. Um, and certainly we, we sort of have different uh, uh, stereotypes of, of what kind of biologists they are and what kind of people they are. Um, however, there's sort of a fundamental connection between evolutionary biology and synthetic biology. So evolutionary biology is concerned with the genetic changes uh, that occur naturally through time, and so we draw these phylogenies to sort of track these evolutionary changes. Uh, synthetic biology is, is interested in editing genomes uh, to confer some sort of function, some new function or improved function. And so both of them are, are concerned with how genomes are changing through time, um, and how sort of adaptations are changing or functions are changing. So there's actually, because of this connection, uh, there can be really nice synergies. Uh, and I usually hate these kinds of, uh, these kinds of like arrow diagrams. Um, they're a little bit confusing. But, but I'll sort of document how our research has gone and, and shown how, how you can study evolutionary questions with synthetic biology and then actually how the evolutionary process can aid in production of better synthetic systems. And so this, this first connection at the bottom, um, basically synthetic biology provides new tools for us to experimentally examine um, how organisms evolve. And for the top arrow, there's many actually examples of how evolutionary biology, or maybe that's sort of the end that I think of more often, uh, but how evolutionary biology uh, can assist in, in creating better synthetic systems. The one uh, connection that I'm going to talk about today is that uh, uh, is this sort of using directed evolution uh, to improve synthetic systems. Okay, and phage are a great place um, to work if you're if you're interested in this in this sort of interaction. Uh, phage have been a model system for evolutionary biology. We heard yesterday uh, from Lynn and Paul. Uh, about these sort of experiment, uh, experiments with phage evolution in the lab. Uh, and there's been tons of progress in synthetic biology because of phage. Um, so uh, the lambda red recombinating system that's often used uh, is from obviously from lambda. Uh, we have PACE, which is a, a directed evolution system that uses phage, phage assisted, uh, I actually forget what it is right now, but some, something evolution. Uh, <laughs> continuous. continuous, thank you, yeah, that's, that's uh, Katie Petrie, my, my first postdoc, so, <laughs> already corrected me, <laughs> yeah, three months in, so, <laughs> uh, and obviously uh, there's, there's been great phage therapy strategies developed with synthetic phage, and this is, I think, mostly by Tim Liu, but maybe some other groups are working on this as well. Okay, so I will show you sort of a case study that, that has come out of my, um, my postdoc work. Um, and it's that I use multiplex automated genome engineering to study how bacteriophage lambda evolved. And then I kind of hit into some problems with the system and I, I designed a directed evolution um, strategy to Im actually improve mage. So doing that, that complete circle. Uh, multiplex automated genome engineering. That one I work with and I do know. <laughs> so, okay, I, uh, I, most of my training in, is in experimental evolution. Uh, during my PhD, I studied the co-evolution of phage, lambda, and E. coli. I study them in these simple flask environments. Um, and and I, I propagate them. I transfer 1% of the population of mixed E. coli and phage from one flask, one day of evolution to the next flask, just like uh, Rich Lensky does his experiments. So during this, I, I saw a very interesting dynamic where um, lambda phage, uh, I should say that 
I don't really choose sides of lambda versus T phage. Uh, my lambda phage is actually lytic, so I feel like I may be best of both worlds or worst of both worlds. Um, but so when you're thinking about the coevolution, this is a lytic mutant. Um, and so I saw this dynamic where the initial interaction between lambda and E. coli is that lambda uses this J protein at the end of its tail to bind to lambb. This is the receptor for, for lambda. That's why they ha share such a similar name. Um, and the first step is that E. coli evolves a mutation in MALT that causes downregulation of lambb. Lambda is actually not completely shut off, it's just uh, turned very low. This confers a high level of resistance, but the phage can hang out. Hang out. And the phage uh, continue to evolve, and they evolve a series of mutations uh, in the J gene for the J protein, the ligand. Um, and then eventually they, the, the phage gets the right combination of, of mutations that allow it to exploit a new receptor, and that's OMPATH. So this is an instance where in the lab we, evolved, we uh, observed the evolution of a, a, a new molecular interaction, an evolution of uh, a key innovation. And so we're really interested in the system in figuring out what actually happens at these, during these stages. So we, we ran the experiment many times um, and we found 24 separate instances where Lambda evolved to exploit OMPF. We sequenced the J from all of those uh, 24, and that's what's shown on the screen. So each row is a separate phage genotype, and each column is a separate mutation that we isolated. Uh, you can see that the phage take very similar paths to get to exploiting OMPF, but they rarely, if ever, uh, take the exact same path. So we can use this, this, this variation to, to begin to understand you know, uh, what mutations are necessary to exploit the new receptor, um, and to learn something about the, the fitness landscape and how uh, Lambda actually navigates to, to exploit this new receptor. So the questions that I'm really interested in are, what are the effects of these mutations? Or more, more specifically, are they adaptive? How does the, fit, uh, the fitness vary during the coevolution? So they're in an environment where the host is changing and that likely affects how the, back, how the phage are evolving and we have preliminary experiments to, to show that. Um, and lastly, are there interactions among the, the mutations? So are there, is there epistasis? How does this influence whether or not the phage evolves the innovation? So basically, I want to be able to measure the fitness landscape and see how that fitness landscape deforms during the coevolution so then I can understand how the phage actually reaches this, this innovation. So uh, to do this in my postdoc, I combine two technologies multiplex automated genome engineering with next generation sequencing. So this is just the cartoon version of the, um, of the matrix that you just looked at. Um, and for, for this study, what we did is we, we found 10 mutations, um, or we, we picked out just 10 mutations. We couldn't study all of them. We're still limited in the technology. Uh, we picked out 10 mutations. We synthesized uh, oligos so that the oligos were exactly identical to the wild type um, phage, except there was a single mutation in the dead center of this 90 base pair oligo. And the next step was to do this mage and make all combinations of those mutations. So 1,024 different genotypes. The way that mage works is that we first get the phage to uh, incorporate into the E. coli's genome. So it's a lytic phage. We fix the mutation so then it could be lysogenic, and then we got it to incorporate into the E. coli's genome. This is important because then we can treat the phage as if it were just E. coli, and we can use uh, things like MAGE to engineer the phage. So we express recombinases in the cell, we add the synthetic DNA, we electroporate, and then in this first round of MAGE, a few cells get a few mutations, uh, or the lysogen in the, in the cell, the, the lambda uh, genome, and the nice thing about MAGE is that we can keep repeating this process again and again and again so that we build up the genetic diversity. We build up all 1,024 different genotypes um, in a single flask of these lysogens. So I don't know if this movie is going to work. Yep, it does. So this is a, a simulation that actually Luis Simon, who's also in the audience, uh, made. And this is uh, showing us sort of how that genetic diversity builds up in the population. Let's, let's try it again. 
Um, and so what you're seeing is that these are mutants with different numbers of those candidate mutations, and here's their abundance. And as we repeat the mage cycles again and again and again, we build up the diversity until we sample that full uh, genomic space. Okay, so then, we, then we, we basically have all these lysogens. We can induce the phage, pop, get the phage out of the, the E. coli, and then we have a pool of phage that should have 1,024 different genotypes. So this is how we represent uh, the data now. Um, this is, uh, I guess I'll, I'll tell you in a second, actually. Um, and then once we have all these genotypes, we want to understand how they function, whether or not they're actually adaptive. And so then we perform experiments where we actually track the frequency of these genotypes. We do selection experiments so that we can measure fitness. And we can track the frequency of the genotypes using next generation sequencing. Lucky for us, these all fall within a 500 base pair region. And so we can actually just sequence across all of those mutations and we can de uh, determine the, the, the frequency of all of those individual J alleles in the population. So we get the frequency initially, we get the frequency later. Remember one of my questions is that I want to understand how as the host evolves, it actually changes the, the fitness of, the, of these different genotypes. So how there's this, this uh, changing fitness landscape during coevolution. And so these are also simulations here by Luis, uh, showing you that we can track the, the frequencies. And so, okay. So this is actually, as um, this is us sequencing the initial population before any selection. So remember I said that we should have 1,024 genotypes, but actually we only have 687 genotypes. So we haven't sampled the full space, but we've definitely sampled the majority of the space. Is that a warning? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay. And then after we run the actual selection, what we find is that the selection is strongest here. We have the fewest genotypes that make it for four hours uh, in this multi-minus condition than in this wild type condition. Can you so, explain what those cartoons are? I have no idea. So they're identical to, so what they are is these are different gen genotypes. Uh, these are different alleles on the y-axis, and these are the, these are the 10 J mutations on the, on the x-axis. So these are, these are describing the genetic diversity um, that we engineered into the population. And we, the way that we generate this is by sequencing the full population with next generation sequencing and just counting up each of the alleles. So what's a big black bar mean? <laughs> a, black, a black bar means that this genotype actually has the mutation. Why is that bar thicker than the other bars? It's just how they're organized on here. So these, each, each genotype has, each allele ha, has, there's 50 it's because there's 50 genotypes lined up next to each other okay. with, that, with that mutation. Oh, so there's nothing about abundance on, on this graph. This is just showing you the genetic diversity at each of the, at each of the, the steps. So, okay. Uh, so we see that, that you know, the, the method works. We've generated all of these uh, genotypes, and that selection is actually strongest when the host is, is evolving resistance. Um, and the next step is actually to quantify what are the fitnesses of all of those different genotypes. Um, and so this, this data is actually kind of a mess. But there are some general patterns that, um, that we can pull out of here. And the general patterns are that um, certainly, uh, I guess we can answer questions. So uh, certainly these mutations are adaptive. Um, in, in general, they're adaptive in both of the host environments, in the wild type plus the multi minus. Um, in general, the mutations are more well adapted, or the genotypes are more well adapted in the multi-minus host, so in the co-evolved host. Um, the other thing is there's a few interesting examples. So this is, this is relative fitness that's being plotted. Um, and, uh, and the relative fitness that we're using is selection rate. So this is the difference in the growth rate of the evolved to the ancestor. And so the difference then, uh, a value of zero will mean that uh, these genotypes are identical to one, one another. 
Um, and so what we see here is that there's even, there's a class of these interesting genotypes where on the wild type hosts, they're actually, um, uh, they have negative fitness, but on the co-evolved host, they have positive fitness. So this is an example of genotypes that because of the co-evolutionary process, there's sort of new genetic space that the, that the phage is able to, to explore. So this is, this is sort of the beginning of our research with this, this stuff. Um, and I guess we, I haven't, I only have a minute, but I haven't uh, filled out the other side, the other arrow. Um, we didn't, the, the, we had problems with MAGE, so we couldn't construct all possible genotypes. So our, our next goal was actually to improve MAGE using directed evolution um, to get at, at, at that much larger uh, fitness landscape. So the challenge is to design a strategy to select for mutations that improve MAGE efficiency. <laughs> Our strategy goes like this, and it works because of, because of this sort of um, ongoing nature of MAGE and how you can use all of these separate cycles. So now we're using MAGE so that we're actually knocking out a gene in the E. coli genome, um, and that's GAL-K. Then we can select for GAL-K minus mutants using 2-deoxygalactose. And so we enrich in this, this population for, for ones that actually underwent MAGE. And then we do another cycle where we reverse that mutation so that now some of the population is actually GAL-K+. And then we reverse the selection so we select for these GAL-K plus genotypes. And we can keep doing this experiment in kind of a figure eight. Um, and so as mutations arise that actually improve mage function, then we're actually going to um, uh, select for those genotypes and we're at, we're at the end of the experiment, we should have a mage system that's more efficient, more effective at, at, at performing these genetic manipulations. And so what we see is, is that actually at, at the end of only 15 days of evolution, we have a much more efficient mage system. So that is connecting those, those sort of two sides of the arrow. And I tried to pack in too much stuff. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but I also think that in 100 years, we will, uh, by combining coevolution and synthetic biology with phage therapy, that will actually uh, put out the traditional people out of business and, uh, and actually. So, what'd you say? It should take 100 years. 50 years. We'll say 50 years. That's, that's, you know, that's if like robots don't kill us and there's not a singularity. <laughs> um, and the way, that, the way that I foresee doing that is actually the coevolution continues longer. Um, and the way that uh, uh, E. coli keeps evolving, it, it changes on BEF, and then it changes uh, PTSM. Um, and so what E. coli basically is doing is starting up at the outer membrane and modifying things on the outer membrane, moving into the inner membrane. That, that step, that PTSM, uh, lambda has a really hard time getting around. I actually haven't found a lambda that is able to get around it. So it, it represents a sort of bottleneck in the E. coli genetic network that the phage you know, gets stopped at if you remove that connection. Um, but like we saw with Lamb B, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience, uh, is that, that's not true? Well, where are we got, you can suppress the cell defects in one step. Okay, so maybe maybe okay. Eight, it's, or one night, apparently. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when we run the arms race, and maybe it's because of the type of environment that we're growing them in, that's sort of the last stop. That, um, you guys should talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the idea is to run these, run these arms races so that, so if we take this really evolved lambda and we take the ancestral lambda and we look for resistant mutants in E. coli, we see that the mutation rate for resistance goes down very, very, very uh, low. Uh, and so the idea is then to uh, basically go through the, the lambda network that it uses in E. coli, figure out where, these, where there are bottlenecks or aren't bottlenecks, and sort of figure out what adaptations in the phage will sort of get around these, these stopping points. Um, and uh, then create a phage that, that sort of has many, uh, has a lot of redundancy in the E. coli network that it uses, so that's basically in, in stop, unstoppable. Um, and uh, to develop high throughput ways to actually do this with each phage and bacteria sort of in a clinical setting. 
Um, and, then, and then also we would have a problem where we engineered a lot of uh, very killer phage. And we don't want to make the same mistake that the antibiotics people made in that um, we sort of used antibiotics everywhere and let uh, antibiotic resistance evolve. We'd want to sort of stop the phage at the door of the, um, at the door of the hospital so that we didn't put it into the environment so that it didn't provide an opportunity for the bacteria to evolve around it. And so the way that I see you doing that is to engineer a Cas9 kind of a kill switch within the phage. Maybe it's turned on by UV light and you have a UV light at the hospital or you just walk into the San Diego sun or something like that. So, okay, sorry. Questions? <laughs>